Welcome to Latter-day Digest. Here's part two of the conversation between Jean Judson, Summer Rain, and myself, Rick Bennett from Gospel Tangents. I have a, a, a bit of a question. So as you started delving more into history, how did you kind of navigate that, right? I mean, you've got your your wife, your children, and you're learning more about kind of um, history that you didn't know before, um, but was kind of there. Like you said, Community of Christ owning all these landmarks. That wasn't really hidden. We just didn't know. I, I remember when I found that out too, I was like, wait, what? Um, how'd you kind of navigate that with your podcast as well? Having people like Elder Snow on and um, Paul Reeve. Um, what was that like for you? Well, you know, I mean, I learned a ton from John. Um, I, 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 I loved it when he was neutral. Now that he's not neutral, I just, I just, I can't listen anymore unless he's got like a really good historian or something. But, and even then sometimes it kind of drives me crazy, but, um, so I felt like, I don't know, you know, there's, I think what, what you're asking and, and tell me if that's it, how, cause I, I'm, I still go to church. Right. Um, yeah. So, because the the question I get a lot is like, how do you know all this stuff and you still go to church? <laughs> is that kind of what you're asking? Well, I I mean I I'm in that same space personally right now where I I still go to church. Um, my husband doesn't. Um, he's a he's a believing member, what they call TBM. He doesn't know the history though. Like he's one of those that just. Um, just doesn't, he's not interested in it, but I'm similar to you where I yeah. just really enjoy the information and the history. So I can't live in that space of just, well, I don't really want to know. Um, I'm in that space where you are, where I'm like, man, I want to hear more, but you do still go to church and, and I do the same. So I guess, um, for our listeners out there, um, that when they do come across these things, I guess, um, how do you navigate that, right? W where you go to church and you're enjoying this, but you're also hearing these, this history, um, which is where I am as well, um, just to kind of hear that experience for you. Not really yeah. how can you, but just, um, just, you know, how does that feel for you? Like, what's that experience like? Yeah, my wife is just like your husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I can remember growing up and people were like, oh, be careful about studying church history. You could lose your testimony, you know, that kind of a thing. And so I always knew that there was some edgy stuff out exactly. there. Got it. Got it. <laughs> some sort um, of tangential thing that might, uh. Yeah. Yeah. So and... you were kind of, kind of prepared subconsciously, like you knew, there might be some stuff out there, but yeah, you, that could shake like, you. I still, I still want to know. You were like, and, I, and that's I, how I am. I've always been kind of academically minded. Um, yeah. And so I've always kind of wanted to know. So on my mission, I was like, you know, they do the scripture chase. I was always, you know, top five. <laughs> you know, I was yes. pretty good at it. <laughs> I memorized really well. Um, so I've always kind of had this interest in these sorts of things and I don't, I don't understand why one person can get this information and it rocks their world. And another person like me gets the information and it's like, well, you know, I, I didn't know that, but okay. <laughs> there's, yeah, the, just... there's this trust issue. Um, and I and, have and family also, members. Rick... You know, people serve on juries. They well, every all jurors receive the same testimony, receive the evidence, and some come to different conclusions. You know, yeah, that's true. It, it happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I don't know that I have a really great answer. I just, I really just want to know what happened. Yeah. Um, I have a friend, um, and and he's black, and he just he kind of expects racism. He's not surprised when Brigham Young's racist or Joseph Smith's racist or uh, anybody, yeah. you know, like, yeah. he's like, I've been dealing with this my whole life. Like that's, that's, yeah. that's just the way it is. And that kind of uh, got me. Number one, it helped me to talk about race better because I found that 
it's easier to talk about race problems with black people than it is with white people. Because mm-hmm. no, <laughs> yeah. white people are so defensive, like, no, we're not racist. And I'm like, yes, we are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All like, of us are racist. Alert. I'm racist. You're racist. <laughs> like it, it's just it's 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 the way it is. Um so you just need to like not, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I just try not to be defensive, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and I think and that's it's hard it. for some people because they're, it, it's, it's easy to be defensive. Um, and, and I just like, I just want to know what happened. You know, well, I if think, this is what I happened, I can deal with it better. I think that's a great answer. Really. I think that really what you're saying is um, I, I'm not tying what happened, what other people did in the past, whether it be profits, GAs, whatever, um, to my own identity. So you're able to academically um, separate yourself, right? You're able to, I think when people get defensive, it's because they're taking on something personally, instead of separating themselves and being able to say, this isn't me, right? I might be LDS, but I am not okay with this. So I can talk about this, um, without feeling like I have to defend it. Uh, whereas what it sounds like you're saying is, is you literally just want to know. It is a knowledge. It's an academic minded thing. And um, I think that's a healthy way to approach it. I, I, I personally have talked to people and I've said, I think it's important to know so you're not blindsided. I, I think people's testimonies on any, not even about being LDS, but even politically, whether it's family, it doesn't matter. Whatever they think they know, if they do not know everything, that is when they are hurt. That is when they um, walk away. That's when there's anger because they either A, did not know, or B, did not want to know, and then it's put in their face. And um, I, I think that that's just a healthy way to approach anything is, I just want to know, just so that's I can right. just yeah. have it out I, there. And I once said, and I think I came up with it, the glory of God is intelligence. You came uh, up with that? It, it, <laughs> might, it might not be, I might have heard it somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, like, the knowledge, if knowledge is there, in you know, way, you, should, you should go get it. Gee, my, my job is to catch plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll run that through your algorithm and see if anybody Somewhere else. I've heard that. I, I, you know, see if it's ever been anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I try to tell people maybe like the Doctrine and Covenants, maybe be maybe. You. Somewhere I've heard that before. In, information is neither good nor bad. Right? <laughs> It's, it's just there. That's right? another genism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, but I like what you said and, and there, you know what? because none of us are responsible for what happened in the past. Right. So I should not take response. So Brigham Young, he said some really racist things and I can still revere him as a prophet. I, you know, we talk about, uh, in you know, the Pope's, in, Everybody believes the Pope's infallible. The Catholics believe the Pope's infallible, but nobody believes it. And in the LDS Church, we believe the prophet's fallible, oh, but no, nobody friend, believes it. My because, friend who's Catholic has said that to me. They, yeah. We believe the Pope is perfect, but but we're taught the Pope is perfect, but we don't believe he believe is. It. And LDS people are taught the prophet is not Human. perfect, but we believe he is. Yeah. And so people, and it's this defensive thing about, well, I've got to defend Brigham Young. You don't have to defend him on everything. You don't have to defend him on the racist things he said because he did say some right. racist things. And that, right. like, I can say, I don't agree with what Brigham Young said there. Uh, but for some people, it's hard. You know, the, okay. the prophet will not really the church astray. Right. And, and for a lot of um, things, it, tough one there. it just makes the figures in the past seem more human, right? Mm-hmm. If you find out they did human things, they had problems just like we have problems with things. And so I remember. When I first heard about the problems in Missouri, I thought, boy, the Mormons in Missouri might have been stirring up trouble by saying, oh, yeah, we're God's chosen people and you guys are going to be eliminated and we're going to be in charge of the world someday. That might have ruffled some feathers. <laughs> maybe, <You think? laughs> maybe yeah. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it's good. It's good to separate. Yeah, the, the the church members in Missouri said some 
things they probably shouldn't have said. Brigham Young said some things they shouldn't have said. Um, and, you know, I the, it is hard. I, I understand why Wilfred Woodruff said, prophet will never lead the church astray. I'm getting rid of polygamy, but I'm not leading you astray. <laughs> right. Um, but it's hard to, and, and, and it's funny because I will say, do you think the prophet's perfect? Well, no. Well, what's something he did that was imperfect? Silence, right. crickets, you know. Right. I can say Brigham Young said some racist things. He was a product of his day, you know. Mm -hmm. He wasn't out of the norm. Um, but I can look at somebody like Orson Pratt. That was one of my favorite episodes, <laughs> becoming a fanboy of Orson Pratt, because Pratt said, and this is coming up in Paul Reeves' new book. Um, mm. It's coming out this year, and I'm going to have Paul back on. Um, where Pratt says we cannot legalize, and I'm paraphrasing, but to some to the effect that we cannot legalize slavery in Utah. Angels will blush if we do this. Hmm. Now, and I don't know what Paul's take is on this. My personal take is California was trying to come in as a free state. I think New Mexico wanted to be a free state, and yeah. Utah wanted to keep the balance of power, so they wanted to come in as a slave state because you know that's we got to have a free state and a slave time. state. Yeah. Right. And so that I think been where the phrase personally, I think that was a calculation by, by Brigham Young, but I'm totally on board with what Orson Pratt said. And I think Absolutely. Yeah. Orson Pratt was definitely more right on that issue than Brigham Young. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think as um, someone who studies history, as you do, I think you could probably attest to there's a little bit of a softening of um, within the church of being um Oh, what's the word I'm thinking of? But just just being so dictatorial and and what we believed the prophets were in the past, if that makes sense. I I feel right now we're hearing more prophets make mistakes. Maybe not from you know in general conference, but I'm hearing more and feeling more of a it's okay that Joseph Smith wasn't perfect. It's okay if Brigham Young wasn't perfect. Whereas when I was growing up, I felt like there was more a no, they were. God was in every step of the way. And everything they did. The like you said, God would never lead them astray kind of thing. And I feel like there's a bit of a, um, no, we're all human. And and I'm feeling that more and I'm I'm hearing that more um, within the church than, and than ever before. So I feel like that helps the nuance there. Whereas, you know, someone, um, maybe my my dad's age and, and older, it might be a little bit more difficult to criticize or be critical of what prophets have said in the past. Now I see the younger generation saying, no, that was wrong. And I'm okay with saying that's wrong. Are, are you seeing that shift a little bit more now as, as you're kind of studying what has been said? I think, Summer, you see that because you hang out with people like me. You don't see that in church. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, that, I mean, that's what I say. And I mean, and, and when I say, even, I mean, even my bishop, who I love, he's very nuanced. I, I feel like there's just this, um, and I go to a Polynesian word, so it is, it is different, right? We have okay. uh, more of a more island traditions that come in there, but um, I don't know. You, maybe you're right. Maybe it's my my circle, my tribe, but because um, I'm not hearing in a general conference, but I do feel like there's more of an understanding happening. Like when I talk to people, um, I just don't feel this dogmatic, this is the way it is anymore. I'm hearing more people say, no, um, it's it's okay. I, I listened to a friend of mine, um, he has a podcast, he's a believing member and he had a historian on there. And the historian was saying exactly what you're saying, which is, well, you know, it's um, we never said they're perfect. We never said they're perfect. And it's okay to say that Brigham Young did things and Marky e. Peterson said things. It's okay. Um, but I've just never heard people who, um, you know, are uh, apologists or who are published by the church come out and say these things um, outside of maybe Richard Bushman, uh, you know, rough stone rolling where, where it's kind of like, let's take a little bit of a different path and talk about these things. So maybe you're right. Maybe it's because I hang out with people like you, but I, I, think, I think maybe, so. maybe the, <laughs> the back, the back row chapel Mormons are talking. Exactly. About. You know, these, <laughs> this is the gospel is. tangents class. We can talk <laughs> right. about these things. The right. Class. Right. That's what it is. That's what because it is. Because honestly, I think 
historians have been talking about this since the 60s. You know, that was when kind of a new Mormon history was coming out and that sort of thing. Um, and so if you hang out with the historians crowd, which I do, you, you hear this stuff. But um, I... I'm very quiet at church. I don't say very much. Yeah. Right. I, I tried to, and then I was like, yeah, this is just not worth like, it. I'm, I'm okay. Just, I'll just keep my thoughts to myself. <laughs> uh, and, and because maybe, uh, I feel a lot of pushback. And even on even on my YouTube channel, um, I get a lot of super Orthodox Mormons that, that defend the status quo. And mm -hmm. so I do feel... So I, I think this is what summer I'm going to teach you a little bit of statistics. What you've got is sampling bias. Yes. <laughs> if you hang out with historians, you hear it more. Yes. But if you hang out with Orthodox people, you hear a lot of the same stuff. Uh, it is changing. I don't think it's changing as fast as what you think it's changing. Um, <laughs> it, it's, summer's it's on very the cutting slow. edge. Yeah, you're on the cutting edge here. That's just, it's, it's just so interesting because I, yeah, I, I think I, I, the people I'm listening to, you know, um, I'm, I'm always hearing now, well, you know, it's, it, they're not perfect and it's okay, you know, and I, and I feel as though it's because they want people to become a little bit more nuanced now that the internet's out there, now that there's historians out there, you can't keep the things that, and, and we'll use Brigham Young as an example, you can't keep the things that he said under wraps anymore. Um, and so I feel like there's just this undercurrent of how do we marry the two? How do we keep people um, in the gospel, understanding their testimonies, but also hearing and seeing the things that have been said by people that we're, we are taught to revere? Um, and maybe that undercurrent is, you know, because I'm in the water. That's maybe yeah. why I'm, I'm hearing yeah. it. But because um, let me just say this. Go ahead, Jay, and then I'll tell you what I Oh, the, the new history book series. What's that called? Saints. The Saints. Saints. The Saints series, yeah. right? That has yeah. a lot more history than I remember, you know, learning about. Oh, so absolutely. People are hearing, That's a step they're hearing forward. and reading more things as well. That's yeah. a huge step forward. But going back to Paul, you know, I, I just interviewed him about his new little book. Let's talk about race and priesthood. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so in my inter in my second interview with Paul, um, he said, hey, I'm going to quote from this 1852 legislature speech by Brigham Young. Because Desert Book came Four to ones. him and was said, we want you to talk about this. And there ain't, there ain't nobody better than Paul Reeve to talk about. This. It's a tough <laughs> Although, it's a tough read. It's a tough maybe, read if well, anyone's ever read it. Matt Harris is more 20th century. Paul Reeve is more 19th century. Uh, those, those are two amazing scholars. I love Matt to death. Paul's, but Paul is better on the 19th century and, and definitely Matt's in the 20th century. But um, he, because Paul, when, he says on my interview, when Deseret Book came to me and said, we want you to talk about this, he's like, I don't think you're going to like what I'm going to say. <laughs> and just to prove it, I want to talk about this speech, this 1852 legislature speech in my book. Are you going to be okay with that? And they said, okay. And then it was really hard that book was really hard to get published and, and almost did it. Really? And so, yes, there is, there is especially when we, especially with regards to race, um, especially with regards to polygamy. And I know Brian Hales did that uh, three volume work on polygamy. Yeah. And the church quotes it all over the place. They won't quote Todd Compton. They won't quote Michael. Quinn. <laughs> There's yeah. a few people they won't quote, but um the, the those are they don't want to rock people's boats, and so Paul and Brian, you know, Michael Quinn, those kind of people, they're they're just too controversial, yeah. and that's why the the church still won't publish those. And so, yes, that, that's why I, I push back a little bit. Yes, the church is changing; they're not changing very fast, and, right. and they don't you like. Still, to, you still have to. They still don't want to talk about rice and priesthood. You, you got to come to a gospel tangents for that. Yeah, okay. you, you still have to thread the needle, even if you're on the very faithful side. You still have to thread the needle if you want to be published and and speak about. I mean, they're tough things, Rick. As you know, mm -hmm. I mean that. Mm -hmm. As soon as you mentioned that um, legislative speech, I know exactly the one you're talking about, and it is a 
tough read um, yeah. when you've never heard it before. You're reading and you're thinking, wow, this was a prophet. But um, I, I do, I, I have hope. I, I'm someone who has hope. I'm the eternal optimist. And I, like uh, Jean, you just mentioned, the Saints book is huge. And so I think even the topic, the gospel topic essays, was a, a big step for the church. And I don't know if a lot of people even understand what a big step that was. And here's what I'm going to say. Some people say, but those aren't official. But they're on the church website. But they're not official. They're not signed. Because <laughs> that's right. been that was been a big problem is... The apostles you know, haven't that, talked about what, them in conference. That's what came out with my uh, Elder Snow interview was like, well, we kind of want to do a soft launch on this. We don't want to like, we don't want to rock people's boats, so we can put it on the website. We're not going to do it with a lot of fanfare, right? So the the people like you and me and Jean that that yeah. that want to want to talk about it can talk about it, and the church can say, look, we're open. We but have. We it. don't want to be rocking people's boats here, you know, because I've had right. people that say the race and priesthood essay rock their world and i was just like really because <laughs> you can read that essay two ways and i talked to paul about this you can read it as hey god approved the race ban mm -hmm. god god was behind everything yeah or you can also read it as hey it's uh bring me on and part of the culture of america like yeah. the last slave i think died in the early 1900s just like 100 years ago you know, no, so, like 1970, I think. Yeah. yeah, whatever. However old they were, would have been like yeah, 100 years old or something time. like that. Yeah. yeah, like when you and I were alive, still. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's not that far in the past. <laughs> all these problems. Yeah. Well, but getting I, back I, to. Oh, sorry, Jean. I was just gonna maybe, say my oh, go ahead. my um dad. I've talked about this. My dad is ADOS. He's a um Af American descendant of slavery. Um, and he joined the church in 83 and did not know about the priesthood ban because it was lifted in 78 um, until the night before his baptism. So, and on the East Coast, we didn't talk about it often. So I'm gonna, I was one of those that when I read the essay, um, I don't wanna say I was rocked, but I was very upset. Um, it wasn't one of those, um, it destroys my testimony, but I read it. I never heard of Elijah Abel. I'd never, I didn't know it was a um, temple endowment ban. I always heard it was just priesthood. And I'd never heard the reasons that was ever given. So the church is saying, we don't stand behind X, Y, and Z. I'd never even heard of X, Y, and Z. So I never heard that we were cursed like Cain or um, not as valiant. I'd never even heard those things. So the Which essay, is kind of good. <laughs> we know it's, ama it's amazing, right? Like I never had members say to me, well, you're not like, I never heard that. But then to read the mm -hmm. essay and to hear that these things were actually said um, by members or, or whatever, it was, it was shocking for me to yeah. say, wait, this was a thing. Kind of like you said, um, when you heard that the ban was lifted, you're thinking, wait, I didn't even know there was one for me. Um, to read it and hear that these were reasons given, um, I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? So it's just, it's interesting that, like you said, people read the essays and um, some of them are just completely like, wait, what? I know the polygamy essay is, is a hard one for people. Um, <laughs> it is a hard one. I, I don't know how you were raised. There's three I, of them actually, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you were raised though, but I I personally was raised to believe that Brigham Young was a polygamist. I never knew that uh, Joseph Smith was until the essays, until actually not even the essays, but years after the essays came out. Um, I, I did go to Palmyra. I grew up in New York, um, and Palmyra was one of those youth conference trips that they would take us on. Was your dad was with the Jets morning. then? He was with the Jets. So he was with the Jets, and then um, when I was born, he was actually with the Raiders. Yeah. But we, we used to go back and forth, and then when he retired completely from the Raiders, we moved to New York, and, and we lived in New York oh. uh, until I was a little older, and then they moved to Pennsylvania. But um, our youth conference trips was driving three and a half hours to Palmyra. And I remember it was on these anti-Mormon pamphlets was Joseph Smith was a polygamist and we were not allowed to read it and, and all that. And so it wasn't necessarily that it was hidden, but we were never taught that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. But for me, 
that wasn't as um, earth shattering, right? It, it was just something that I never knew until I read the essays. But um, I, I don't, I just wanted to make the comment that I, I can understand why certain, why the church wouldn't want it to be as prominent, but to make sure that um, if it, if asked, they can say, no, we do have an avenue for that, you know? Yeah. So, and that anyway. was purposeful. I mean, I could yeah. just know said that on my podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, since we're a podcast about podcasts, and you mentioned uh, learning something from John DeLynn, when now I'm wondering because your formats are you have a longer interview and then you cut them into parts. Is that you shooting a, ba- a shot across John DeLynn's style? And saying, oh, you don't have to have 24 hour episodes in order for people to watch. Or, or what was the purpose between, <laughs> between having the parts? Well, you know, there's, it's called differentiation. I'm not shooting at anybody. <laughs> um, for one thing, I mean, I John's podcasts are way too long. I, I, he gets into way too many details, like just cut to the chase. <laughs> but uh, no, part of me wanted... That's right, Rick. What was your favorite primary song? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. But um, what part of me was like, I want, I want to give people just a a little bit, and then I want them to be like, well, I want more. What's next? So, so the idea was, and then you know, and one of my, I'm a statistics guy. One of my favorite podcasts is Freakonomics, and. So that was where I stole that from. Because you, you'll notice at the end of my episode, and in our next episode, we're going to talk about this. Yes, like, so I stole that from Freakonomics. And so, because oh. I wanted people to be like, oh, I can't wait till the next episode come out. Um, and so that's that's a lot of, of why I did that was, uh, I think, number one, I think it's good. It gives people, people don't a- have four hours or eight hours to listen to an interview. Mm-hmm. My commute to UDU is about 20 minutes. And so that was kind of why I was like, oh, 20 minutes. I can listen to them on my way on my way to work. And right. you know, I don't. They, I mean, some people have that. longer commutes. I get that. But, you know, I think the average they get a topic is about 20 minutes. And they can so, move on yeah. to the next one later. Yeah. And hopefully they they, they crave more. So that's, yeah. that's, that's what Bite I'm hoping size. for. And was that? Oh, no, I'm not beginning? shooting any shots at anybody. Yeah, you did that from the very beginning. I was just teasing yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Ladder Daily Digest. Oh, it's going out to my thing there. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you flashed no. Yeah, the um, Ladder Daily Digest starting wars one podcast at a time. Great job. <laughs> Good, great job there. <laughs> That's right. So I consider John a friend. So, and, sure. and you know, honestly, I learned a ton from him, um, yeah. this, you know, so. I and and we're going to have um, l- links in our description to much of the, as much of the media that we mentioned, if people want to look up some of the books or some other podcasts, uh, talking about John DeLynn's, um podcast with historians and stuff. In, 19, in 2013, he interviewed Edward Kimball. And yeah, it, it is so problem. fascinating to listen to the child of a prophet talk about his experiences. You know, I have somewhere on my shelves. Do you have both the books, uh, Spencer so, W. Kimball and the Length in Your Stride ones? Oh, it's right. Yeah, let me grab it really quick. Just one second. Pulling pull a backyard professor here. <laughs> We're grabbing some books. Boy, that's right. I. I, there was a book I wanted to show, but I can't remember if I was going to show it at this episode or something. Wow. There this is published by Benchmark, I believe. This is the full version of Lengthen Your Stride. That wow. You can get it on the CD-ROM, but it's way thicker than the Deseret Book version. And the coolest well, right. thing about it. What year did that come out? Uh, let me look here. 2004 um, or something. This is one of the best. This is my favorite. And I didn't know it was actually signed by Edward Kimball when I bought it, but um, where is it here? 2009. So the coolest thing about it here, I'm on page 96 and 97. You'll notice here, if I can get close enough, some of those are in blue and some of it's in black. Yeah. So the, and I can't remember the color coding. I think the blue is the, and there's your CD-ROM. So wow. we'll compare size of the look. Compare this. See, mine's way thicker, and it's wow. and mine's a, yeah. yeah. So there's so much more information in this book, and um, 
so you have the CD-ROM, though. You, if you have the CD, it's everything that's in this book. But he includes stuff that they made him cut out of this rep book version. And, and it's in blue? Is that what you're saying? I can't remember if it's in blue or in black. Okay. Uh, let me read it again. Um, was it just too long? Is that? It was way too long. Is that why this book happened? is how many pages? This yeah, is so like the, the race in the priesthood chapter is like, 47 pages if you if you do the uh, CD and there's like 12 pages in in this book. Wow. Yeah. And wow. so I think blue is the extra stuff that was not, that was cut out if I remember right. And um there's this just this is I think this is my favorite book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it's really expensive too. Yeah. <laughs> but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, this is my favorite book. It says it's working draft, and uh, yeah, they made them cut. How many pages is yours, Gene? Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna turn the page. Let's see, up till the appendix is 415. Yeah, and so this is 2000, so there's like three, four, wow. seven. Wow, just a couple more pages. <laughs> wow, and they're, and they're like big, it's like. You know, eight and a half by eleven size sheets. And the writing is so small. It's not like it's it's this. Oh, huge. it's it's normal. It's it's normal writing, but yeah. Well, I'm saying it's to do just, two thousand pages. It's it's yeah. a good number. That's a good number of uh pages there. Yeah. So my and favorite Rick has book memorized book. every word. Of, <laughs> no, no, of no. <laughs> I I will say I haven't read the whole thing, but chapters. I remember nineteen, twenty, and twenty one. Like there was some stuff about the Middle East. Mm -hmm. That I don't know why. Well, I mean, to cut three fourths of the book, I mean, you're going to have to cut stuff that doesn't. But there was just some stuff about like missions to Saudi Arabia and Egypt and stuff, and I was just like, "Holy cow, this is amazing!" So, and so yeah, John Delin interviewing Edward Kimball is fascinating, and I am happy for every minute of detail that he does in that episode, right? Some other interviews, maybe not so much. But yeah, so he writes um, Spencer W. Kimball, and it comes out in 1976 or something. And it's like, hey, Dad, I wrote a book about you. Before you die, we're going to get this out here. And then all of a sudden, the uh, the Lengthen Your Stride, Spreading the Gospel program comes out, and Blacks you know, get the priesthood. And Edward Kimball's thinking, oh, yeah, I need to do a part two. But Edward Kimball has a family. He's teaching law at BYU. It takes him, what is that, 20-something more years, 25 more years to come out yeah. with the part two. Yeah, it says and, it was 77 when that came out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it was written in 76. And yeah, come out, published in 77 after all the edits and stuff. And, and then, yeah, the second book comes out. And, and that's where I started, you know, I actually saw... BYU education department or something had the race, the full race in the priesthood um, chapter that's in the CD. And, and I read that and, um, and it was fascinating. I'll just say. So, was, and I will tell you also as a preview, I've already talked about Paul Reeve, but Matt Harris <laughs> was really good friends with Edward Kimball. And yeah. um, and he wow. so there's going to be some amazing because his book's coming out this year too, mm -hmm. and uh, so those are the two books I'm looking forward to this summer. We'll see who gets Matt Harris first. Yeah. Oh. So hopefully <laughs> the race is on now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I so, just before we let you go? Can I just make this book your favorite? Because you can see a lot of that Um. What makes Somehow we this lost book? you, Rick. Summer, go ahead and start yeah. that question over. Sorry, I was going to say, what makes this book? We can see in the background you have a ton of books there. Why would you say this book is one of your favorite books? Well, because three fourths of the stuff that's not in Gene's book is in here. <laughs> <laughs> and, so. and you know, it's it's history, but it's contemporary to Rick and I. Yeah, exactly. Because I remember some of these years, and um, there's just so much more information in here that's not in the Deseret Book version. Um, wow. So it's really, 
I mean, you part of you can look at it and say, well, why was this cut? Well, because they didn't want it to be a 2,000 page book. Mm -hmm. It's not that they, it's not like they were like, well, you got to cut that because it's controversial. Because a lot of the stuff isn't that controversial. I mean, some of it probably is, but um, there's just so much more information. There's so many more details in here. And I will say this I've had some private conversations with Matt. <laughs> He's told me some stuff off air. The stuff that he's told me on air is amazing. Right. But some of the stuff that he's told me off air is just like. Be uh, his, because he got book? access to President Kimball's diaries. And, wow. and so, and well, he said on my podcast, um, well, because there was a rumor that uh, President Carter was going to go after the church with the IRS because mm. of the race ban. No, yeah. it wasn't because of the race ban. Like was BYU, it? something about it was BYU. because think, of women's issues or something. Uh, well, it started under Nixon. So, like a title because Carter or Carter was seventy six. Well, maybe I guess it could have been at the beginning of Carter's presidency. But anyway, he's like, I wrote a, a letter to President Carter, and he responded. <laughs> I was like, Oh wow. my gosh! Because <laughs> wow. Carter was like, Yeah, I don't remember what you're talking about. Basically, that was the <laughs> answer. <laughs> There was this one issue, and there was this other issue, and yeah. I was like, it's like wow, to be doing there's history on living people, on. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a lot going on then when I was president. I don't remember that, but yeah. 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 So, But I guess it was the Nixon administration that kind of went after BYU over the race policies, because they were like, you know, we can't admit black students. I mean, and... <sighs> Like they were pretty overt about it, and the yeah. and the IRS. So the like, yeah. was it the IRS or the Education Department? One of them was going to file a lawsuit, and then I think BYU hired a black professor or something, and they're like, "Okay, that's good enough." <laughs> it's a starting place, baby steps. Yeah. 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 So I'm trying to set up. I I won't tell that story, but I, I have another story about BYU, and well, here I'll, I'll say it this way. There's a coach for BYU. Well, he's been at BYU and Utah. That kind of gives away a little bit. But he said it's way easier to recruit black athletes at Utah than it is at BYU. Oh. Um, and um, so, and it's, it's, I mean, BYU is, they have a lot more black people now than they've ever had on their football team and basketball team. Um but there's a, you know, it, it kind of has a reputation. It has a stigma and, you know, that, that BYU doesn't like black people. And he just said way easier to recruit at Utah than BYU. So, and you right. can see over the last, you know, 20 years. Yeah. That's he's true. Not talking about the football field. He's, <laughs> he's not talking about the 70s. He's talking about the 2010s. Yeah. Yeah. He is. Yeah. So. so anyway, well, is there anything else about your podcast? Do you have anything, any guests coming up that we people we could send people over to watch coming up? Well, my the one with Ryan Craig, and that has been a super fun one that I just released. Um, uh, this Scott Vance, I don't think people are going to know him very well, but he's got some interesting uh, findings on how groups like FAIR and uh, – um, the More Good Foundation are funded, which are pretty interesting. Um, I've got a new I'm thinking they use money with uh, Mary Jane Woodger, mission president or spy. Um, she's a BYU professor. That uh, this guy here, uh, Wallace Toronto, uh, served a mission in Czechoslovakia during both the Nazi administration and the communist administration. Wow. And, uh, so he's got some crazy stories. That would be interesting. <laughs> so yeah. That'll be coming up. That, that's a story most people don't know. Um, and Mary, she's Mary Jane. She's pretty cool. Uh, I haven't, I haven't recorded it yet, but uh, we've got that scheduled. Margaret Toscano is coming up. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, this recent September 6th book with Sarah Patterson. Um, and I think she has some critiques that people are going to find very interesting. Yeah. I haven't talked to Margaret yet either, but those those are a couple. Sure. Um, and On the uh, horizon. yeah, so I've got some BYU professors, Joe Spencer, Spencer McBride coming up. I hope. Um, hmm. So yeah, there's there's some good stuff. 
So I like that I can talk to both people that may be out and and in the church, you know. The faithful and the not so. So even though I'm a Utah guy, I still like BYU. That's right. (laughs) I like to give them a hard time, though. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Presidential scholarship. I'm never going to forget that story. (laughs) It got you a shirt, though. Clearly, yeah. I don't know. I don't know, know who I am. Clearly. <laughs> Rick, thank you so much for taking this time with us and, and just letting us know about your podcast and about you. And it's just, it's so great to interview people who are, um, I guess what they term, like, in the middle that are able to see both worlds, to kind of step in both sides, and um, just to get your point of view on those things, but also hear a little bit of history, too, because I personally love that stuff. So I think it's just thank you so much for taking all this time with us today. Yeah. Well, this is why we get along. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wind me up. Let me talk about history. We, I can talk about that. We're good to history go. History amazing. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, like and subscribe. Go to Gospel Tangents and subscribe. We, need, we, we all can use subscribers. Everybody yeah. needs subscribers nowadays. Yes. And, and so, subscribe so anyway, to Latter-day Digest, too. We're in 2024, and this is this year. It promises to have lots of exciting things happen uh, all throughout the year, throughout the world, and so we're, we're we are part of living history right now. We're living history. Absolutely. So anyhow, talk to everyone later. Bye, Thanks, everyone. everybody. Bye, bye.